So welcome everyone to this week's machine learning coffee seminar. So this week we have a very exciting talk by Professor Simo Serke on GPU computing for large scale learning in state space models. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, you can either ask them at, at the end of the talk or also during the talk. So just for example, write them in chat. Okay, so Simo, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, indeed uh, feel free to ask questions, but uh, I try to keep my chat window visible as well. So if you prefer to put questions there as well, that's, that's fine. But uh, yes, so the title of my talk is, uh, is GPU computing for large scale learning in state space models. And uh, I'm in it, Simo Sarkka, I'm from Aalto University and also affiliated with the Finnish Center for Artificial Intelligence. So this is the context of the talk contents uh, I start with with the goal of the whole thing so what is the what are we aiming at and then uh, uh, algorithms uh, first like a tutorial on parallelization algorithms and how, how you can actually do that then how you can actually implement that in in real GPU machines or GPU GPUs and then some experimental results so what the results look like and then finally, I will conclude the talk. So what is the goal here? So what we have, we have a uh, probabilistic state space models, uh, well, which, which are important in, in, in many fields. So what state space models mean is that, uh, well, over here down, you can see an example of, uh, well, one notation for state space models. So we have a, uh, some kind of state xk where k is the time step number and we have some kind of dynamic model which tells how the state evolves in time and then we have a we have a measurement model so we don't actually measure the state but some kind of uh, proxy or measurement of it which is modeled as, as some kind of um, the measurement vector given the state vector and uh, uh, the typical example is, is target tracking. So you might have a say car or aeroplane or something like that uh, with, with state contains say position and velocity variables, maybe some other variables. And then you have uh, some set of uh, measurement devices, say radars or some cameras detecting well, some object in the, in the scene or then uh, acceleration sensors or so on. So they typically go this to this y and x contains indeed that state with positions and velocities and uh, other variables. And so this dynamic model is typically derived from some kind of stochastic differential equation or learned from data or well, it depends on the situation. So this x can also be like a discrete value. So in speech processing, you use this kind of models a lot. So then this, uh, this might be some kind of syllable identifier, for example, and then we measure some related quantity. But anyway, so in that context, they are called HMMs or hidden Markov models. And in um, historically, in all kinds of space applications, these kind of systems have been very important because you need to localize objects based on very noisy measurements, and and that's important. And uh, this is also related to machine learning because kind of uh, Gaussian process models in temporal domain are mathematically the same thing. And also well state space models as such are, are important time series models in, in machine learning. So it, it fits the topic of the, of the seminar as well. Uh, well, speech processing I mentioned already. Audio signal processing in general. Yes, they are used in, for example, restoration of audio and also identification of audio events and uh, audio-based localization. So the applications. And biomedicine is another important application area. Okay, then what's the aim? So our aim is to, so we only get to see the measurements, which might be the radar measurements or whatever we measure from the speed signal or then uh, some sensor measurements from, I don't know, radar or similar measurements in, in some space applications. And we want to determine state sequence X. 
and there there indeed are so it's a long it's like it's an old problem and therefore there exist a lot of efficient algorithms to do that and uh, something called filters and smoothers well you could call that optimal filters and smoothers or basin filters and smoothers all the same so the, the, they are uh, like a linearly well, well they are efficient in the sense that they they scale linearly in the number of time steps and as we know that in in some sense you cannot go beyond linear in the number of time steps if you want to process all the time steps so they are optimal also in, in that computational sense and uh, so in general they are basin filters and smoothers but then we have a column of filters and smoothers for like linear gaussian state space models then like a forward backward kind of algorithms i guess that's the name in, in the case of hmms like uh, discrete state models and then there's the classical viterbi algorithm which computes uh, map estimates the maximum a posterior estimates in in very efficient manner so on the right well uh, so the problems can be divided into prediction filtering and smoothing problems de depending on like uh, the horizon of measurements and the state estimates that we are looking at and the computational properties well they are all linear time in number of time steps but it the, the details depend on what we want to actually do and this is an illustration of like a discrete state model so it's a viterbi algorithm domain then but anyway so these are not really designed for parallelism in the sense that uh, there is a like a forward pass and some kind of backward pass in in all of these methods and they are like a they, they're tightly coupled in time so that, that at least trivially you cannot really like a divide and conquer well it turns out that you can but that is the, the basic algorithm that don't allow for parallelization in this time axis so they are o n even if you have an infinite number of uh, parallel processors so it, it doesn't kind of help as such yes but, but this talk is about so how you can actually do better that's because well, O n when you have n measurements, it's it's in a like a non-parallel classical sense optimal because you 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 will have O n if you need to process all the measurements. So no algorithm can be better because then it needs to skip measurements. But it, it's not that simple anymore in parallel case because not all the processors need to touch all the measurements. So you can actually do better than O n in the sense that the, the overall time will be strictly less than 10 for example uh, in for example log n which is indeed the case over here and you can even have an o n uh, or like a o one algorithms for even if you have any measurements that just means that you can process all of them in parallel and uh, it's different things so it's it's called span uh, i guess that yes it's, it's span complexity when you have like a, the, the parallel complexity so what is the longest path computational path given the parallelization of course like uh, the work complexity which is more like the number of uh, actual total op total operations which is happening it, it's it's always at least n because otherwise you wouldn't be processing all the measurements at all which would be a good idea because you need to throw away measurements and that's work complexity work complexity but now we are trying to Im improve that uh, span complexity which is the one which you actually measure with with the clock when you wait for something to finish that work complexity is that uh, how much energy you actually consume with that gpu of yours okay but uh, i mentioned gpus already so they are available well nowadays and and they are devices with huge number of cores so this is already quite old one actually on the right but th that's what they typically look like and they can run well i'm promising millions of execution threads simultaneously well at least tens of thousands is easy nowadays maybe even millions so if you compare to say gpus you can only have like a couple of tens of threads even with the most sophisticated cpus you can easily have a 
couple of orders of magnitudes more in those GPUs. And that's why they are very well suited for parallel computing. And uh, well, and originally, I guess, these kind of processing units were meant for like uh, generating computer graphics. So, so they are actually, well, graphics processing units. So they are designed to generate each pixel graphic very efficiently and the, the parallelization is, is, is very good. And uh, so these devices are also extensively used in, in deep learning nowadays. For example, TensorFlow, I guess it's a Keras library and uh, others, well, supports GPU computing a lot. So that's, that's why these are also um, well, available for general public using machine learning methods nowadays. And uh, so, but the programming model internally is a, is a bit different from normal GPUs. So it is not really so that you can just take a GPU computer program and then like run it with million execution threads in a, in a GPU. Well, it kind of is, but uh, you're not going to get the benefits of the parallelization just by doing that. And uh, so the low-level programming uh, uh, API or well, the toolkit, I guess it's the name, is called CUDA, which is uh, well documented and available from NVIDIA. There's also some other manufacturers for well, similar frameworks, but that's, that's what I'm going to discuss mainly today. And these TensorFlows and others are using CUDA underneath already, or the computing interfaces. And yes, so it turns out that you cannot just parallelize computations like I, or parallelize any algorithm in the sense that you're going to just take your bubble sort and run it in GPU and expect for huge computational benefit. But you need to somehow have a, have some kind of a well, the algorithm to have the problem that it somehow decomposes the problem into independent subproblems. So you need to somehow have tasks which can't be independently solved, and then you maybe combine the result. So, indeed, if you happen to have such a problem that, well, it consists of 10,000 independent tasks, then it's uh, maybe it's called embarrassingly parallel problem or trivially parallelizable problem then, well, it's easy to get the computational benefit in, in a parallel computer. But if you don't have that, it's not always easy to see what you should do. But it turns out that uh, quite many, like uh, inherently sequential looking algorithms can be reduced to something called all prefix sum computation. It's a Well, we'll, we'll see how it can be done, although it's, it seems strange that you can actually like a, all, all, all the inference in state space models can be turned into prefix sum computation, but it actually turns out to be possible if, if you just define sum to be a very general operation. So indeed, um, it turns out that this arbitrary sum operation in the sense that uh, it's just an associative operation with the associativity property, uh, then you can make a certain kind of a divide and conquer algorithm which lets you to do the computations in, in log n parallel or more specifically in, in, in span, span log n time. And uh, okay, so that's the question, can we do this inference for safe space models? Yes, I mentioned that you can actually do it already for them. So let's see how, to, how you can do it. So, well, yes, so we can indeed do that. So we can use something called scan algorithm which is one of the par all, all parallel prefix sums or all prefix sums, sums algorithms to, to do that uh, filtering and smoothing and V3B and uh, forward backward in lock and time. But you cannot just take the algorithm as such. So you need to actually reformulate the whole, whole equations of the algorithms. So you use the same kind of ideas in the background but the equations are completely different. We'll see those in a moment. And uh, so these algorithms, once we do that, uh, they are suitable for GPUs and parallel clusters and 
I guess TPU is Google's name for those. And then there are some other brands of parallel competing units. And indeed, uh, this kind of formulation is also very good for TensorFlow and uh, other similar frameworks. And the idea will be, which we see in a, in a moment, is that uh, you kind of make a computational tree and uh, so that you can do the computation for, for pairs, then the, for like four element blocks and then eight element blocks. And it turns out that you only need to have a log n levels in the tree. And uh, then you can do a down pass, which then generates the final result. So let's see how you actually do it in general. So let's start with the prefix sums problem. So we, we have some kind of sequence of numbers, a1 until an. Well, you can think about, think about like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until say 10. And then we want to compute something called prefix sums. So first is one, then it's like a one plus two, one plus two plus three, until the tenth element. And uh, well, yeah. So this is a pretty simple problem. But more generally, we can already think about uh, some kind of associative operator, and we, we want to compute the more general prefix sums. So this could be a matrix product, for example. So that this would be A1 and then product of first matrices, product of the three matrices and so on. Or it could be partial differential equation solver, which somehow combines the um, those semi-group operators, which is by the way, quite close to what I'm, what's going to happen in the filtering and smoothing. But anyway, so whatever our associative operator is, so associative names, so it, it means that we can move the parentheses like this. So A operated to B operated to C is the same as A operated to result of B and C. And we also have some kind of neutral operate element, neutral element. We could call it zero or in the case of multiplication, it would be one or so, so some, something which, if you just operate any element with that, it doesn't change it. And uh, so we can think about like a simple sequential solution, which looks like this over here. So we start from S zero is equal to zero or whatever the neutral element of the operator is. And then we just uh, compute the next sums by like a adding, adding one, the next element to the previous one. And this takes O log on O n O n time, and there's no easy way to see how you can actually reduce that to something else. But it turns out that you can actually do it because you can use this associative operation in a clever way so that you uh, change the order of operation so that you only need to have a log n in parallel. Yes, so here's an example how you can actually do it. So that um, instead of just like a sequentially looping over these values, what you do is that uh, you first form a, um, a tree like this. So what we can, well, the, these are the elements and then we can form like some of these two elements, some of these two elements, then some of the all elements will come like it's the same as some of these elements. So we get, uh, so this would be one plus two is three, three plus four is seven, and then three, three plus seven is 10. And then we can do at the same time, we can also do this sub three. And what we get out of this is that we first get just a summation of all the values, but now in log n levels. So if you have parallel processors, what we can do is that we do all of, all of the like a left to right order. This is done in parallel and uh, in the end we need only one, two, three time steps to complete the whole thing. And uh, in general, if you have n elements, we need log n steps. Uh, log n like uh, clock time steps to actually do that. Uh, so the total number of operations or the work complexity is indeed O n. So that there's something 
in parallel is, is processing all of these. So kind of the energy consumption is n, but the time taken is just log n. Of course, we need to have enough processors to be able to do that, but that's, that's only also part of the assumption that we have. Um, and this actually works for any associative operator. So we could also have matrix multiplication or, well, the party of differential equation solver which I mentioned or, or something else, or the filtering operators. But this only gives the sum. But it also, also gives some kind of partial sums. And it turns out that we can actually generate the whole prefix something by doing a down pass. So what we could do is that um, we do this kind of down pass. So we assign a left value for each of the nodes. So root has L is equal to zero. Then every left, left side inherits the present value of L. And then right side gets the left side sum plus the current L. So from here we get that, well, the left value of us is zero. And then we go to the right. Then uh, this right side gets the left side sum. It's 10 plus current L. So this is 10. And with the same logic, we get like a 10 and 15. And then we, in the end, we output this plus the current value, which gives 21. And it turns out that if we take a look at all these, this is exactly going to be the prefix sum. And the nice thing is here is that again, all these paths can be taken independently. And we only did the log n steps in the sense of a number of levels in the tree to actually do that. And uh, so th this is the basic idea that's present in all of those. This, this is an example of scan algorithm for computing the prefix sums. So it's a kind of tree based up speed and then down speed. So all it does is that computes these prefix sums in log n time. But provided that we can reformulate our methods as computational prefix sums, so that will be fine. So we can also think about the string concatenation. I don't know how useful this is, but anyway, so it's one way to debug what actually is happening. Uh, this is the up sweep, so we combine these. So this is a string. Uh, yes, so the basic elements are these, and then this is the concatenation is, is the associative operator here. So we combine these, 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 and then these, these to get the full string. Okay, so that's that. And then the L value kind of corresponds to left some kind of prefix over here. And uh, well, it's, I don't, I don't have the arrows here, but so you, it would be possible to see how we actually generate all the, all the prefix sums. And uh, okay, so you can, I think the formatting is a bit off because this has, should be over there. But anyway, so that's another example of a prefix sum operator. And what it actually does, it looks like this is some kind of uh, old MATLAB code which computes that's prefix sums. So there is a, like a loop, the up sweep is some kind of loop from zero level to log n minus one level. And then inside there, we, we loop over all the values on that level of the tree. And then on the down sweep, we have similar thing, but from up to down. And this is a one particle by, by, by play lock. And the nice thing is that you don't actually need to form that three explicitly, but this is just um, operating on that single array. So, so that the memory consumption is just on as well. So you don't need to have that uh, n log n memory for the three. And this code works for any, so we have plus over here. But you can certainly re replace that plus with any associative operator and it will compute all the uh, prefix sums for any associative operator as well. And so 
turns out that you can actually do that for filters. So now there's a, okay, so, so this is the classic filter, which is kind of, so it's, you start from k equal to zero, and then you loop over these operations from case one, two, three, four, five until n. And so it's a sequential algorithm which computes, well, you can see that these are as prefix sums if you think about, well, these are like cumulative things. So x, k, given the previous measurements from one to k. And then the next one is uh, some kind of cumulative given from one to k plus one, and one to k plus two and so on. And these can be seen as prefix sums of certain kind of operator. And operator happens to be that kind of operator on the right. So if we define the elements, well, they're on the, on the left here. If we define the elements to consist of uh, this kind of transition distribution, F and then uh, likelihood kind of quantity, G, then, and, and you define these to be the elements that we, so instead of the numbers in the prefix sums, one, two, three, four, five, we now have a pairs of F and G over there. And the, we define our operator like this. So it consists of, uh, well, it's an operation, operation between these pairs. And then uh, it operates, so we compute that kind of normalized integral and then that kind of integral. Then it turns out that uh, actually this pre prefix, well, this is just one of the sums of the operator or sums in some kind of quotations. So it indeed contains that the filtering result and it also contains that the normalization constant. So it means that the computing all the prefix sums for this associative operator is, is exactly equivalent to computing the filtering filtering distributions for for all k. And that's the point of this one article. But it also means that, that we can actually parallelize the whole thing using this kind of this parallel algorithm. So, so we can do the whole uh, filtering with in log n time. So we don't need need uh, or compute all the filtering distributions for time series length n in log n time. So not O n because uh, we have a parallelization now in the operation. And uh, in linear Gaussian case, this does become a set of matrix operations. So instead of just plain summation, our operator is slightly more complicated. So the operator consists of uh, this kind of set of matrices and, uh, and vectors. So there's uh, a matrix and this is vector. And they actually define, they are representations of those uh, densities, Gaussian densities corresponding to that um, transition and, uh, and the likelihood. So they just parallelize, uh, para parameterize them like this. We need to use the information from Gaussian to have a, for it to be definable. But anyway, that's, that's the detail. Uh, and the operator is just, so when we have a, a, B, C, E, that J corresponding to step I. So here is A, I, B, I, and then the corresponding ones for step J. Then the combination operator for getting the combined one looks like this. So it's a separate set of operations. Well, you can kind of see a resemblance with certain type of information form of karma filter if you see but anyway so it doesn't resemble karma filter so much but it turns out that this is actually karma filter in the sense that it computes that the karma filtering results using these associative operators and the final result if you look at the equations in the end so this b and c will contain the karma filter means and covariances after doing that associated with scan so after running this kind of methods. So this final result is in S, so it's a vector. So these will be the filtering densities. Um, I mean, th these are the five element 
things and the filter identities can be picked up from the one of the or two elements from them. And you can also do this for smoothing. So, so what the result looks like, uh, so the elements will be this kind of conditional smoothing distributions, which are uh, so, so it, it's a backward kernel from, well, first it's from k plus one until k, but that's actually when you combine the elements, they will be like a k plus bigger number given the current one and given the measurements on that block. And that um, associative operator looks like this. So you just combine the kernel, so it's pretty simple. And then you can show that actually this sum kind of quantity will be the smoothing distribution. And in linear Gaussian case, you will just have these matrices over here and vectors. And the combination operator is quite simple operation between the matrices, things like that. And you can also extend this to nonlinear case. So because extended comma filters and smoothers, they, they, are, they just linearize the system and then you basically apply a comma filter. So that kind, of, that kind of idea can be used to construct those nonlinear estimators. So you just uh, you only need to parallelize the linearization, which is easy because the linearization is a local operation. So it's it's kind of uh, trivially parallelizable, and then the column pass or uh, smoothing pass can be parallelized by using that uh, linear Gaussian result. And well, you can also do, do the same for sigma point based methods. So you can also interpret them as certain kind of linearization. So there's this paper on that topic. Going to appear in proceedings on, of, of ICASP. It's not yet there. And well, you can also do the same for HMMs. Well, because HMMs are kind of special cases of the state space models. But there are also certain kinds of uh, specific algorithms for HMMs. So, uh, so HMMs can't be seen as discrete state, state space models. And then you can actually use that uh, generic solution which we already had for doing inference on those. But then it, it's more classical to actually formulate this in terms of like a forward backward kind of methods which is slightly different. And for that, it's, it's natural to formulate this in terms of potentials so that we actually reduce that to something called the Bayesian graphical model. So if we define these, then we can see that as a, a graphical model with just pairwise potentials. And then the question is that uh, can we actually parallelize some product algorithms which correspond to filters and smoothers and max product algorithms which be, they correspond to Witterby kind of methods. And uh, it turns out that you can actually do that. So these A's are now the potentials where it's actually easy to see then like afterwards the correspondence with, with that filtering and smoothing which I had already. And this sum product operator, so this is the associative operator for the, for the sum product operation. And then for the max product, we get the analogous one. And um, you can also do the Witter V in a sense. So, so that uh, there's certain kind of difficulties in that. But anyway, we have, they are discussing in this paper, which is only in, in our side right now. Implementations. So one way is to use QDAP and Numba which is uh, one Python library, which is kind of Python compiler actually. It can also be used to generate the code a bit for CUDA target. And uh, so it looks something like on the right. So you just define that it's a CUDA target. And then you basically write, write, the, write the GPU or CUDA kernel manually. So it, it gets, I guess, translated into CUDA C code and so on. I'm not sure what it does internally, but something like that. And um, another way would be to use the C or C++ CUDA interface, which needs more work, but 
you have more freedom. Uh, okay, so the right hand side. So this is actually just example of how you would implement that uh, Playlocks algorithm in that CPU, or it, it is actually an example of implementation of that. And um, and this can also be directly used in in call up of Google if you don't have a GPU computer at at home nowadays or office in normal situation. Uh, so you can also run the, that on an actual GPU if you wish to using call up. And then you can in principle do that uh, filtering smoother, but then you get you get some practical limitations. For example, that uh, Python compiler doesn't allow for any matrix routines inside the kernels because you cannot do the dynamic memory allocation in that. So you can actually do that, but you need to kind of write your own homemade matrix routines, which is not a good idea in general, but you can make it work. Another option would be to use, say, C++ CUDA, which supports eigenmatrix library, at least to some extent. So then you don't need actually need to do this manual implementation. But yes, so it, it can, but it has certain other, so it's a bit tedious to write. So that, that's why we, it, it's, so that's, that's where these uh, machine learning libraries, like TensorFlow, and then there's these checks and maybe even PyTorch and those support these operations, I'm not sure. But anyway, so for example, TensorFlow already has this Playlux algorithm implemented. So we don't actually need to write our GPU code ourselves. So there is this uh, asso scan associative, which is going to do exactly the computation, which I was, I was discussing. And what you do is that you put the filtering or smoothing or HMM or EKF operator over here, and then it produces you the result. And Jack's library also has that. And so both of these, so provided that, uh, well, you have certain kinds of primitives that, that are, can be used for, you know, for forming this function, but they, there's more freedom than in, in plain CUDA anyway. So you basically have the full matrix support. You don't need to write your own Kolaski factorizations. And also you have automatic differentiation support. So if you want to compute the gradients of uh, say, uh, likelihoods or log likelihoods, you can also do that. And it turns out that TensorFlow was very fast. So based on our archive paper, they actually did implement a version of this already. So there is even parallel filter. But we also have our own example codes if you want to test. So there is a example code from the from the automatic control paper indeed contributed by Adrian. So you can find well there's the link but you can find them. So there's you can run it directly in, in call up or then uh, there's also version which you can just clone from GitHub. And the nonlinear extension can also be found. There is no call up link directly, but it should be quite easy to actually, actually run there as well. So this is a nonlinear extension. Okay, so what does the actual results look like? Well, these are just the dull graphs, but uh, what you will get, so this is what you can generate yourself by running that uh, Kalman filter example. Well, what happens is that, so this is the number of data points and this is the runtime. And this sequence is just when you do the Bayesian filter or Bayesian smoother, actually the, the Kalman version. Uh, well, this is in, in C CPU and this is in GPU. So also in CP CPU, you get some computational or time benefits because you can actually parallelize in CPUs as well because you can run more than one, one thread. So th this is resulting from that. And indeed this was using Jack's library, I guess. No, no, this was the TensorFlow version. Yes, this is running in TensorFlow. And then 
so this is in GPU, so you actually get uh, much more benefits from parallelization because you have a, you can do like tens of thousands of threads instead of just a couple of tens. Um, this is for non leader case. So again, in CPU you get a small benefit, but that's it's but it's basically a linear growth starting from couples of tens. But in in GPU, well, you get a much faster, or like the scaling is much better in the number of time steps. You can also see the the point where the number of cores is like runs out. So th th then the growth kind of goes back to linear. Uh, these are for HMM, so there's like a, oh, okay, so Adrian is commenting, no benefit on CPU because it's using Chuck with single threaded. Oh yeah, so you could actually see the benefit over here, but only on the right, that's correct. But this for HMM, this is uh, again, well, this is all, all the GPU result. But anyway, so you, what you get is that, uh, mm, well, on the right, you can see roughly that logarithmic growth. It's not easy to see because uh, the time are so small. But anyway, you get the logarithmic growth until you run out of the, out of the number of cores. And then it falls back to linear. But anyway, you get the computational time benefit anyway. So conclusion, so we were discussing all prefix sums, which can be computed in parallel using scan. And one of them is, is by Blelock. And this sum can be any associated operation actually. And uh, these kind of algorithms are useful in, in particular in parallel computing or well in GPUs in parallel hardware. And uh, so inference in probabilistic state space models can be reformulated as that kind of sequence of associative operations, which makes them parallelizable. So we get parallel Kalman or Bayesian or Vitropy kind of methods. And uh, we can implement everything with CUDA, but luckily we also have TensorFlow and JAX kind of frameworks, which have that scan implemented already. So we don't actually need to do everything ourselves. And these are some references, indeed, the classical ones in the book about CUDA and then state space models. Well, there's it, Murphy's book and my own book. And then these are the recent papers by ourselves where we discuss these kind of, kinds of methods. Yes, and these are some people who have been working on this. So me, Angel, Sakira, Adrian, Fateme. Song. But I guess this was all from me. So thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Simo, for a very, very impressive talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, you can either mm -hmm. write in chat or just directly ask. Hi, Simo. Hello. Uh, I had a question. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so is it right that both the filter and the smoother have their own sort of uh, scan through the tree and then downward scan to the tree separately? Can you repeat? So your sound was a bit breaking. So do filters and smoothers have different scan? Oh, sorry. They have their separate uh, like scan up through the tree and then down through the tree. Uh, is that right? Yes, yes, they they do because um, like a, you need to have like an up and down scans for inside the filter and then also, mm -hmm. also in, in the smoother and actually those well at least in this formulation the the whole operator is different for filtering smoother. Right. And but but there's one thing is that uh, you don't you could use the same operator for the smoother as well to get something called two filter smoother, mm -hmm. but that, that's not what you asked. But the, the answer to your question to your question is that you need to do both up and down, 
in both filter and smoother. Cool. And so for the, when you were just summing up uh, uh, numbers, it was clear that the thing at the top of the tree was just the total sum. Yes. Is there some interpretation for what the thing at the top of the tree is for the filter, or is it just some arbitrary collection of the, of the model matrices? I, you can't write it down, yes. So it's because these distributions are going to be, okay, so it's not written down, but for filter, it's all, always like a XK. So it would be middle of the sequence given the, like the starting point is integrated out. So it should be, uh, it's a bit, Oh, is it something? Oh, so it's actually like some sort of distribution over the center point of the time series, or is that the wrong way to think of it? I guess, yes, it should be something like that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's more for intuition, really. It's just, uh, yeah. Because it's not actually the full sum, or is it actually? It is possible to write down, but it, it, it's a pair of distribution for, it, it is either the middle, it should be the middle point, I guess. That's a tough question, but it's, <laughs> it's possible to figure out what it should be. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I, I think not. So I think we are out of time. So I would like to thank Simo again and also the audience for, for your attention. And we can now conclude this session. And next week, uh, Juha Rose will talk about drug combination modeling. Okay, so. Okay, thank you. you. Kiitos, Simo. <laughs>